This is a presentation of the Wells Historical Institute and Friends of the Salem Landmark Church. Welcome to the 2011 Summer Series of Great Leaders of the Past, showing God's grace in the history of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Featuring Johannes Bodding and the way he led a becoming confessional Wisconsin Synod during its early years. With historical background and insights by Mark Wagner, pastor of Our Savior Lutheran Church at Grafton, Wisconsin. Presented in the Salem Landmark Church, birthplace of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod in 1850, currently being restored to its original likeness. It's my privilege to introduce to you Mark Wagner from our Savior's in Grafton, and we thank him so much for taking this topic, and uh, just, let's give him a moment. Thank you. Once before I stood here and I did a wedding for Steve Betcher, who, run, who does the Wells Connection, he happened to be at Wauwatosa at the time. I served at Wauwatosa for 10 years. I've been at Our Savior in Grafton for 14 years. They did their wedding here before the white altar. And uh, that was about 22 or 23 years ago, something like that. And ironically, they are in Mequon and our kids had gone to uh, Kettle Moraine Lutheran together. So it's quite a, quite a blessing. I can honestly say this uh, is a humbling experience to uh, encounter the people that uh, were standing when this building was built and then to encounter them not just in an ex, uh, external way, but start to read and research, you become attached to the person. It's amazing. As you do the work, you begin to, you begin to really identify with them and you hear their thoughts and you begin to wonder um, how the people of that era could have accomplished so much. And I am uh, amazed and uh, by it, I, I can honestly say it has uh, uh, reframed for me again uh, what a privilege it is to serve in the ministry. And when God calls, just like the, the hymn says, it's amazing when, when the Lord does that to each of us and not just to pastors. Now, um, a couple of historical uh, pictures are here. Bodding's picture is in this. It is in German. Um, there's a picture of him. You can pass that around. And then there is a, an 1880s photograph taken inside of St. John's uh, where he served, St. John's in Milwaukee. Uh, that's where he landed in 1868, so five years after this building. And then he remained there until 1908. For 40 years he stayed there, and uh, obviously if you've ever been there, that, that was quite a sizable church. He was involved in the building project, I believe, that uh, resulted in the um, building that we now have. To the paper, and uh, we'll take off. I was uh, introduced to Salem a lot of years ago. I, uh, I served in uh, 87 at uh, St. John's, and uh, President Nominson was here at the time. I don't think Dan was probably uh, too far along in school at the time, but uh, I got to meet and interact with President Nominson quite a bit during those early years. And uh, it's a privilege to have that connection. Also, Ken Artlip, I can say uh, place between two doctors. I hope I don't disappoint you, but this, I'm not the historian or the, the massive uh, uh, mind of the men that flank me the two doctors. Um, what I do have is an interest in preachers and Bodding was definitely a preacher. So the two things we're gonna take you to is 1865 and 1875. 1865, you'll find out an interesting, uh, interesting event. And uh, 1875, the 25th anniversary of the origin of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. And uh, he preached at the, um, the uh, proceedings for the Synod Convention. Now, I'm not going to um, run every word on here. I will read some of it because I need to be precise. Uh, some of it I will skim over and summarize. On the first page. What I've entitled this is a pastoral initiative that brought us peace. And there's two words I want you to keep in mind. Conflict, even in the spiritual realm, uh, draws upon those who are brave and leaders, and then peace, the result, 
is always something that God provides. Conflict is going to be there. Peace is what God provides. On the first uh, page, um, let's start there. A parallel worthy of consideration. I'm going to start with uh, prayer that the Lord uh, in, inspire us by what uh, Pastor Bodding was capable of doing and some of his words. Heavenly Father, help us to understand that in the 1800s, the human beings of that era were just like us. Sometimes they were overwhelmed with the challenges financially and physically. Sometimes they were um, smug and uh, content with their own position in life, perhaps their own intellect. Some of them would uh, pick on others. And yet there was always a pendulum swinging between the old Lutheran intellectualism and rationalism that would uh, sometimes take people into a pride and Pharisee position. And then there was the other side, the reform side that was enthusiastic but would lose uh, trace of what the Word of God says. We see a man here um, that you used to lead your church and we pray that you would remind us how inspiring it is to be around those whom you have called and used as your tools. From the apostles of the New Testament to this man, there is a direct line because your word is ever living. Amen. President Johannes Bodding uh, brought his, uh, leadership, uh, leadership in the troubled early years of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod parallels the quiet, determined influence of the man whose death had unsettled the nation. Now here's the parallel. On Good Friday, April 14, 1865, two years after this building was built, Abraham Lincoln was shot in the back of the head while watching the play Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Lincoln, a man known for courage and unyielding determination under fire, was assassinated just five days after they had brought about the signing of the peace declaration. It was uh, the, uh, the surrender of Robert E. Lee. Conflict, even the proportion of civil war, had not stymied his quest for truth, fairness, and freedom. Slavery could no longer be justified by Confederate landowners. The deadliest war in American's history, uh, which resulted in the deaths of 620,000 soldiers. We can't even comprehend it. That's on our own soil, our own uh, people. And it affected almost every family across the nation had not been in vain. Though costly, peace now seemed attainable. Abraham Lincoln's day had started well for the first time in a long time. Hugh McCulloch, how do you like that? Um, the new Secretary of the Treasury remarked on that morning, I never saw Mr. Lincoln so cheerful and happy. No one could miss the difference. For months the President had looked pale and haggard. Lincoln himself had told people how happy he was. And it seemed as though the cost of the conflict had been worth it. Bodding had already, by this time in his ministry, he was 40 years old, become a spiritual warrior. Five years prior to that event of our first sermon when he was elected as the second president of the Wells, at the 1860 convention, Pastor John Bodding of Watertown became the voice of confessional conviction. For the next five decades, he held as tight a reign against unionism as Lincoln had held against slavery. The, they were not actually... Uh, acting blindly, writes uh, one of my professors, E.C. Frederick. Um, and he just, he's got an inspiring piece um, that you might look up. It's quoted in here. It, he's really, really, uh, Frederick's mind is just incredible. And then when he writes, you can barely take it all in. His 11 pages has way more historical uh, background than mine does. Um, the 14 pastors present all new body who had always let others know how he felt and where he stood. The second decade would be the most crucial of the first 10 decades. Capable administration and sound leadership would have to be provided. The Lord had provided the fledgling, uh, fledgling church body a leader that would be able and capable of uh, taking them forward because of his, his uh, commitment to the word and his confidence of the truth. So you see the parallel? And now you'll begin to understand that it was a sermon to uh, cover the funeral of Abraham Lincoln that we will hear parts of. On the trail of truth, that first paragraph I'll just summarize as saying, um, Pastor Bodding was born in Germany 
1824, and uh, he started off as a wheelwright and a journeyman, and it actually took him all the way into Hungary and other places. But um, then he was uh, kind of overwhelmed with a couple of sermons and involvement with a congregation, like most pastors are. That's the way it started for me at age 14. The Lord kind of laid his hand on me, and I tell you, you can't walk away from it. I was doing a, a paper route at the time, and my mom said, well, um, you just pray. And I think I prayed the whole hour and a half while I delivered papers. When I came back, I said, well, Mom, I'm going to New Ulm. I'm going to be a pastor. And I really didn't look back uh, from that time forward. So the Lord laying his hand on bodying is very similar. And as I experienced, uh, um, I don't know if any of you remember uh, J. Paul, uh, J. P. Mitra, was an Indian pastor that affected a lot of us when he came and preached for mission fests. I was raised in Norfolk, Nebraska, and there's a connection back to Exonian Lebanon. That's where our ancestors came from. My people were the uh, original uh, train uh, schooners that went across in 1865, by the way, at the end of the year, at, or in the, at the end of spring, and they uh, set up their first camp and they created St. Paul's Lutheran in, in Norfolk, Nebraska. So my roots, the Wagners, go back to the beginning of the Wisconsin Synod and uh, to the time, in fact, when Bodding was at Watertown. And it's interesting to hear some of the, the history that's there. He was a, 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 a missionary at heart. He was drawn in just like I was by Mitra. And he was drawn in and his first intent was to go to Africa. But uh, then as he studied under Harms in Germany, and Harms had a lot of influence over the, the quality of uh, Lutheran confessions, he, he got the impression that he just couldn't cut it. They really put a lot of pressure on him, and there was a controversy that broke out. And uh, somehow or other, he got in real trouble. He got in hock with the headmaster. And when he did, then what happened was, of course, he was kind of laid aside, and they said, we don't know for sure if you can, you're going to make it. It took him about six months to solve that, and when they did, then he was sent down, he proceeded into Berlin, and he finished his studies. A uh, very intent and very scholarly man, uh, no doubt about it. I think he's probably more personality than just uh, brains, though. He's probably not your professor type so much as a forceful leader. And uh, he was then uh, sent by Harms over to Milhäuser in Milwaukee, and uh, Milhäuser would be the one that would send him up uh, to, to the area that he would land as his first parish. Ended up in Calumet, and that next paragraph at the bottom of uh, page two kind of gives some insight into that. Bodding's fervor for faithfulness brought him into early conflict, even with his supervisor, Milhäuser. Called to a small congregation at Calumet, west of Manitowoc, John insisted that he be ordained and pledged to the Lutheran Confessions. Milhäuser dismissed this request as so many wasted words or paper fences, but later accommodated uh, Bodding's wish. Two years later, when he was accepted as a member of the Synod at Granville, Bodding added a postscript, and he said, uh, basically, he wrote um, and the Lutheran Confessions. And, and as it turned out, Milhäuser was the only one who handled those documents. He struck that comment. So you kind of wonder, well, what's going There's tension going on here, you know? And in fact, what you find out here is there's a lot of tension in the air. Man, I, I don't know, maybe they didn't have so many things to occupy their brains like we do. I, they were more active. I don't think they were as passive as we are. And in active uh, arrangements of communities, they listen to every word and they take issue with a lot of words. Amazing how often that happens. Curiously, after he crossed this out, um, you get a kind of a, a comprehension of Milhäuser's stance at the bottom. Admittedly, his, patriar his patriarchal influence was there. It was already commonly understood that Milhäuser had a tendency to accommodate reform sympathies to gain financial assistance. This reputation held the conservative brothers at arm's length, wary of his private motives. So Milhäuser had those reformed leanings. So the first decade of the Wisconsin Synod had the influence of Milhäuser, the starters, and uh, what you find then is when Bodding comes, you begin to have a shift. The top of the next page. Um, really what happened then at Calumet was this showed up right away. He had people in the congregation, 
who took on uh, his Lutheran stance right away, they were really not there for doctrine. They were there to oppose the Methodists and the Catholics. I mean, you know, same as it is today. And uh, what ends up happening in that paragraph, what you hear is that up in that north area by Manitowoc, he began to have quite a bit of influence. They would send the young men up to train with them. And the one thing that they shouldn't ever do to train, and, and this has quite a bit of documentation in the histories, is plaster walls. Because he and Kaler get together to build Kaler's uh, parsonage, and when they do, their plaster job falls on the ground. The first plastering falls down. Well, then they're told, put in pig bristles. And they do. They put in pig bristles, and it sticks. But basically, the observation is that the wall looked like a, a, a hush and... Hudson Calvary had gone through it. In other words, it was wavy like this. And, and interesting, they even make observations that it was so, so rough that thankfully it was in the upper room, which then became the office for Kaler, and nobody would have to see it down on the first floor. And it wasn't until they were in there, and then they would put up books, and so nobody could see their handiwork. It's just interesting. Uh, but very accurate in their doctrine, these men. They were very zealous for missions, and uh, they began uh, to uh, journey north all the way up to Algoma, and uh, they began to consolidate new mission starts. So as the immigrants came, you had Bodding and Kaler and Rhyme and a couple of the others that were uh, closely linked together, and they really were looking for mission uh, starts. The next paragraph has a long quote I want to take from Bergholz. It's in that first line. The reception of congregations as members of synod in those days involved many difficulties, since many of them were union groups made up of Lutheran and Reformed members. To obviate some of these difficulties, the 1856 synod appointed Bodding and his neighboring pastors of the Northwestern Conference to draw up some constitutional amendments, which outlined the obligations in relation of new admitted congregations to the synod. Evidence of Bodding's hand to them is found that he requ required the signing of the Lutheran confessions. And a little bit further down, when the ingathering of more members was the chief thing and the doctrine and practice were relegated to the background, these uh, constitutional amendments heralded the approach of a new era in the Synod's history. So uh, Bodding and his co colleagues had the courage to stand as they did in their congregations and in synod is a matter of no small moment to us today. Um, he must have had enough impact because at the age of 35, he was then elected to replace Milhoiser. 35, he was the new president of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. That next paragraph uh, talks about how Walther was uh, skeptical and often skeptical. Down in Missouri, they had the theologian. Nobody in our circles ever quite uh, came up to the levels of C.F.W. Walther. And everybody knows that, that Walther was a brilliant uh, um, exegetical scholar, and his writing just was uh, phenomenal. They were the conservative Lutheran uh, branch at the time, Missouri. And uh, Walther really had his reservations about Wisconsin because of Milhoiser. And word would travel slowly so that about the time that it got there, the news got to Missouri, they might have already cured the problem, but it would linger in reputation. They didn't have this text, that, oh, you should come and see what's going on at Salem Lutheran. You know, it's just amazing what they had to live through. The next paragraph, Bodding arrived at his new calling at Watertown to St. Mark's. How many of you have been in St. Mark's? Have you been there? I did, of course, because I went to Northwestern College. I sat at uh, St. Mark's. I preached at St. Mark's. Just an aside, this is what happens to young pastors. I was still a student there, or a student at seminary, senior at seminary, when I preached at St. Mark's, the historic pulpit. I am going to climb this one, and I, I will watch so that this doesn't happen to me. But when I preached at St. Mark's, you have to open a door and climb a stairs. But when you do, you have to duck because they made the, the thresholds lower than us six-footers. You know, I'm six-foot-one, and those guys were smaller. So when I went down like this, I walked up my robe, and uh, the guys that were watching said, oh, there he is. No, he isn't. Oh, there he is again. I had to literally back down and then come. So preaching in St. Mark's holds just a dear remembrance for me. Ooh. 
And of course, because you're in front of your college professors, and oh my, what a, what a historic event. So Pastor Bodding arrived. And here's what Watertown looked like back then in 1867, seven years after Bodding's arrival, showing the Synod's newly built school in the upper right. Um, when he moved in, that paragraph then states that what he did was already in the first congregational meeting, he had a new constitution. Bingo. Here we go. And there was a lot of controversy in Watertown during those days. There's this whole branch of old Lutherans that you'll hear about. They were the ones, and I'll explain them a little bit more later, that would often be a source of irritation for him. And even almost more than the Reformed influence. Reform was pretty cut and dried. It was the old Lutherans that were kind of agitating underground all the time. All right. Um, the Constitution was again based on the historic Lutheran symbols, the confessions. At the next meeting, a Lutheran liturgy was then adopted, and they got rid of, they blacklisted a bunch of the hymns that were Reformed doctrine. So you can see, he's right away going to take charge of the doctrine and practice. Um, and even before he came, he said uh, to the congregation, I am opposed to lodges. Now, lodges, I didn't do much study on it, but you know how, you know how societies are. Those secret societies that were there at the time often had their own breed of people that they were members of the congregation, but they had representatives of other things going on, more the, the cultural things going on. So he was opposed to that, and the congregation said, okay, we understand that. Um, interesting, then when he came, the bottom of the page, um, what he ended up having to do was replace uh, Pastor Sons. Pastor Sons, who was pastor at Watertown, actually got ridden out on a rail. There was an event uh, before Pastor Bodding came where there was an attack, a mass approach to get rid of him with what ended in the constable, the, the guy that was in charge, came and shot his gun in front of the crowd and said, you're not going to do this to this pastor. Who then appealed to the legal authorities over the fact that they wanted to remove him. So there was quite a bit of controversy going on. And uh, it was because of uh, a lot of political things that were going on in addition to the doctrine. Um, that bottom of that page, um, interesting. When he came, there was a desire right away to start a worker training program. Now, you can understand this because they were beginning to branch out. More Germans are coming. There are Lutheran ties back to the old land. They're going north because they're, um, you know, finding land and breaking ground and doing their agriculture. You got more and more congregations, and as these young pastors were touring and collecting people, they needed more pastors. And where would you get them? Right now, the only training uh, ground was down in St. Louis with Walther. You'd send your guys there, or you'd have to get them from Germany. And so one of the things they were committed to was creating the college. And as soon as that happened, they actually started it in a house, in Professor Moldenke's house. They started it with just uh, uh, a handful of, of students. And then, here's Pastor Bodding of a major congregation in Watertown, who was requested, as the president of the Wisconsin Synod, to take a tour back to Germany and get money. So he loads his whole family up and carts over there, goes to New York and out of New York, right past, you know, uh, that beautiful harbor, and ships out to uh, Germany and does his tour to raise funds. All through the north, he's well known around Harms area. He even raises money for Harms. Uh, and then he goes a little bit east, and uh, this is kind of a little bit more where my bloodline runs, uh, near the Prussian borderline, and into Russia where there were some Lutheran congregations. And he actually had an uh, audience with the Tsar, and the Tsar gave him permission to preach in the Lutheran churches, and he raised a lot of money and got a real significant ring. So there's interesting facets to this whole thing as um, he raised the money. He got enough money there uh, a grand sum of $13,000 that would then stage uh, Northwestern College for the whole next uh, decade, really, because they were able to build a building, pay for the professor's salaries, and uh, approach a little bit no more normative uh, with libraries and, and classrooms. So 
Um, all of that was accomplished by body. Well, meanwhile, he has to step down from the presidency, right? You're gone, you can't do it. He stayed over a year. So it was about a, uh, probably, see, 18-month uh, tour overall, 17 months or something like that. They wanted him to come back in February. They write him a letter and say, please come back, you know, because by then there's more agitation building, even though he had a replacement pastor. And he said, I can't, I can't do it. I, I've still got to finish the round over here in Prussia. And one of the hardest things that you realize in this time is, is how uh, difficult their lives were. Um, his wife was back at home with her sister who died in childbirth. So can you imagine taking your wife back over? She sees her family. Her sister dies in childbirth, and then you have to tell her we're going back to America. So, you know, really some harsh conditions. And uh, they would often say the travel was difficult. And man, if you can imagine traveling on the ocean in February in those days. All right. Now, confronting the grave with truth. Six months later, the reality of Christ's resurrection gripped all who grieved the loss of the country's chief executive. Five days after Lincoln's murder, I'm on the top of page four, and three days after Easter, Pastor Bodding held a funeral service along with almost every congregation in the nation. Bodding's concise contemplation of the event links his own heart to his hearers. Now here, I'm going to go and, and begin. I won't preach the whole of it, and you'll see that I, I can't memorize. I'm not going to memorize Bodding's sermon. It's recorded there for you. But what I am going to do is, is kind of give you a little flavor of it, okay? Uh, I, I don't have the voice of bodying in those. Another issue, right? They had to be able to project. Um, we don't do that. I can't imagine preaching to the likes of St. Mark's current church without a microphone. The death of our president brought grief not only to one home, it has visited the entire nation, he says. We mourn for the deceased as though they were from our own immediate family circle. And uh, this yet is a truth that he belonged to all of us. Should not all of us be in, ready in spirit to accompany his remains to the grave, and so we celebrate today. Then he tells a story about Emperor Charles V, who was the emperor before whom Luther stood in, in the, uh, the whole concept of Worms when he was in trial, the one, the famous man to whom he replied, I, unless I can be shown this from scripture, uh, I will not recant. So the emperor of the entire uh, Holy Roman uh, Empire had an interesting uh, take on life. He decided to have his funeral sermon preached to him while he was still alive. So he got a coffin, brought it to the church, climbed in, and had the preacher preach to him. Bodding describes this and says, you know, how unusual this is, and that the emperor was so affected by that that he began to collect around him people who would emphasize that you are saved by grace, by faith alone. And he really uh, demonstrated in his own life then that he had a desire for the truth and uh, that's amazing that he would have been influenced all the way back you can see from Luther then at the um, the toward the bottom of that page he says I think all of us should be aware of when we celebrate the, the the life and the death of our president we should be aware of what it would be like to die he doesn't say that we should climb into our own coffin but he does say we should contemplate it spiritually we should take a look at what it means to die and to die in faith. And in fact, there what he talks about in that paragraph is that we consider everything about our life, our heart, our repentance, um, our, our faith, our relationship to God and our hope. And he says uh, toward the bottom there of that uh, paragraph, he says, um, may this memorial service today, our service to God, bring us all a lasting blessing as we consider what does our funeral service teach us today? And then he quotes from Psalm 90, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Every single illness, every change in our life, every hardship, basically, should point us back to the grace of God and to our journey's end. And so he begins to relate President Lincoln's death 
to our own. And how powerful that is. I mean, this is no small intellect. Um, as you flip to the next page, um, what he talks about is how unfair it is that Lincoln was cut short right as he had uh, come to that point of peace. And now my major themes are don't be afraid of conflict when you have the truth of the word, but when you have it, you will always find the true peace. Unconcerned about his life, uh, President Lincoln attended the theater that evening, and as he entered uh, the, the presence where he had been urgently invited, uh, so John Wilkes Booth also arrived, and uh, he closed himself into the presidential box drew his uh, single-shot revolver, put it to the back of the president's head, and pulled the trigger. Um, he did get away, by the way, and ran, and, and it was uh, many days before John Wilkes Booth was, was killed. He was, uh, he was shot uh, as they burned the barn to chase him out. Um, the murder had done something despicable. But bodying is tying us together that, uh, that there's something that really should call every one of us. It should bring a lump to the throat. Can you imagine? This church here is actually uh, was, was standing when this event occurred. I, I don't know the history, but maybe there was a service here just like this for President Lincoln. Can you imagine the, the, the hurt? Some of you lived through the assassination of JFK and uh, hurt for the nation. So he ties this very emotional event back to each of us. He says a sudden death is, is a, uh, a, an evil death. When it happens like this, he says, how can you even relate to this? You have to relate to it by saying, I could die at any time. And basically, then he says how, how uh, unusual for the president who went for entertainment that night to find himself entertained by God himself, to find himself in front of the judgment seat, uh, how, how, what a change, what an incredible change it was. Had he prepared, and, and Bodding then cites that the president had every evidence of being a Christian, that had every evidence that he understood God's grace. And he even uh, would, would talk about the fact that President Lincoln in his most recent addresses had shown or demonstrated his dependence on grace. Then I have a, 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 I'm at the abhorring part. Uh, you'll see I make a couple of comments. That way I can pace you, middle of page five. Abhorring the wicked act of the scoundrel who hurled the president in the arms of death, Bodding exib exhibits the Savior's unconditional love. Look at this. In this sermon, he says, let us not cry vengeance and wish that God punishes him for it. We can only pray, Lord, forgive that evil deed and wash his blood guilt away from his conscience with your blood. Let us pray only as the Savior himself prayed for his murderers. That's gospel truth, isn't it? That looks at someone like John Wilkes Booth and instead of saying, kill him, forgive him. And he concludes that part of his sermon by saying, um, and I'll, I'll summarize it kind of quickly, is that we have to be able to recognize what a gift we have been given when the gospel is proclaimed, that salvation is only in Jesus. When you contemplate your own death, you have to have an awareness that God has influenced the preacher to talk to you directly. Uh, to sit in that funeral sermon and hear that would have meant that you were hearing uh, your own funeral sermon in a way because of the consciousness of the nations. And he says, he says, accept that righteousness from Jesus Christ, which is the imputed righteousness, or what we call the active obedience of Christ, and be aware what the passive obedience of Jesus, the death on the cross, has accomplished for you. Now, from there, um, I'm going to return down. And All right, uh, at the top of page six. Do you sense with me that Pastor Bodding was a gifted man capable not only of administering his own church, but skilled as a pastor whose heart beat in rhythm with the gospel of Jesus? See, and that's what you want to kind of see of these men. They weren't just administrators, guys that could write in columns and make decisions. They were human beings with a huge responsibility for leadership. And in the early days, they stood the test. Now, on, on uh, faithful directing of ministry, that next paragraph says that uh, we actually don't attribute to these men uh, maybe the due that should be there. And that might be why we do something like this. 
Because you kind of want to hear, I, I can conceive what you wanted to do, is almost hear from a, a modern preacher what the man was saying. What, how, how would he approach it? What that paragraph says is it's not in our Wells DNA to give much tribute to the administrators of our circle. In fact, this comes from Kaler, who often would say that the presidents ranked way below the teachers in the classroom. And there's a really powerful thought there, and that's that the word is the instruction. The leaders are only humble servants. So there's something really grand in that thought. But there's also, in history, uh, a powerful influence of these men like body. The next paragraph then says, Dare one minimize the role of a faithful servant who, when called to lead, did it so effectively that he made a rigorous schedule filled with demanding decisions look easy. You cannot believe the schedule these guys had. And traveling often on foot or by rail or by buggy, they got around to their congregations, checked up on the young pastors, and kept the doctrine clear. They didn't have computers, email, and, and other things. Now, we get overwhelmed with information, but they had all of the challenges we have and more in many ways. So now then, that paragraph talks about how Pastor Bodding... Uh, had continued to build this influence on the young people. That's one of the things I want you to see, is in the midst of all this, he also held in the conflict, we have to have Northwestern, Lutheran, or Northwestern College. We have to have the training school. And so he not only raised funds in Germany, he actually went around the area, and when he did, he would ask the churches to support the college. And he would ask them to support one another. When a new congregation was coming, he'd ask, well, help them. They're starting. They need a pastor. Get them going. At the bottom paragraph, um, now I start to quote some of the uh, addresses that he had. 1861, you go back, uh, back in time before uh, President Lincoln uh, that had, had been killed. And in 1861, uh, Bodding's influence began to grow. He would come into those uh, conventions, the synod conventions, as those first lines say, in 1861, he boldly summoned his brothers to hold fast to the word of God and suffer all rather than depart one hair's breadth from the truth we have learned. And he continued, especially do we want to be diligent and learn to rightly divide law and gospel and to point out to our congregations the precious gem in our Christian doctrine of salvation, the justification of a poor sinner by faith. Now, to see this in action, to see our well, E of our wells, I got to tell you the little history here that happened. Uh, as he's still now the president, this is before he went to Germany, but there was an episode over in Lebanon, and I have interest personally because that's where my roots were. These were probably my ancestors that got into this tip. They, the old Lutherans uh, were those who had come over, and many were in the, the Missouri Synod, but the old Lutherans were those who uh, kind of were uh, a little bit elitist in their intellectual grasp and they, they must have been the, the kind that had a lot of uh, social uh, graces. More education, more money. And when they came to America, they brought with them a tradition that we still see occasionally in Missouri Synod. Instead of going back to the Lutheran confessions and back to the Word of God, which is more important, they would go back to the writings of the 17th century. And then they would establish their practices on the historical activity of that day. So instead of having it right from the scripture and saying, this is adiaphora, they would do what was done in Germany. So at Lebanon, and then they influenced those in Watertown, they asked that the, pa the pastor do the interview. And some of you probably did this. I did as a child. He would sit in the sacristy, and you would go to the sacristy and you would tell the pastor any of the sins that you had, so private confession prior to communion. Yeah, many of us kind of grew up in the old German traditions. The old Lutherans, however, insisted that it had to be done that way, and guess what happens? Now you have like the elite, the really good Christians go and talk to the pastor and the others don't. <laughs> you know, by now we, we can't even handle the uh, activity level of that. As a pastor, I, there's no way I could handle the activity flow. There was something good about it because it gave personal interview. 
personal face-to-face -face contact for the pastor. But um, what you see here is that Bodding held with his other conservative young pastors, he held the evangelical line. That meant you don't have to do this. You can. It's valuable, but you don't have to do it. Page 7. At the top paragraph there, the first full paragraph, in his 1862 presidential address, Bodding expounded further on his love for the word. Aware that his Missourian friend Walther had referred to the Wells confessional statements as fine phrases that lack all substance. <laughs> See, that was Walther's uh, idea of, of the Wisconsin Synod. He pointed out that the confessions of the church must be considered binding, not, and we were taught this at, at SEM, not to the extent that they agree with the word of God, but because they so agree, if they are to mean anything as confessions. And so right here what he talks about is the subscription to the confessions can never supplant the word of God. And that's why they wanted their own uh, college and seminary so that they could train the guys in the truth. What you see is the beginning of what we currently have and have had for years and years is a, a treatment of the Word of God that has an incredible high respect for the direct Word of God and our, our current influence on the languages, the Greek and the Hebrew. Um, these were men who really wanted the truth of the Word of God and were willing to dig it. Um, influence on future pastors. Now the whole concept of this is that at Northwestern College, uh, that would lead to a seminary and we could infect our own people with that same spirit. And instead of letting the reformed activities and the political influences of the area happen, and even Walther, we could affect our own change, and that's what Bodding wanted. So the, the next several paragraphs kind of talk about how this built in that relationship uh, with his influence at Northwestern College in Watertown, and then into the Synodical Conference. Now, Bodding's leadership was of such a caliber that he was respected by Walther. They were mutual. I don't think that he, uh, Walther looked at him as the theologian of the Wells, but he respected his leadership tremendously. And even when uh, there was word down in Missouri that Wells hadn't changed, they were still uh, in unionistic practices, um, when the word came that, that Bodding said no, he believed him, he trusted him. And now what you have is from that 1865 sermon to the 1875 sermon that I'll just briefly quote, you have this emerging synodical conference. There is, there is the trust that is growing between Walther and Body. There is a, a whole influence of the young conservative pastors who pull away from the general synod in the east they, they are uh, together with the general council that's uh, over at, in the Ohio area, but eventually they can't tolerate some of those uh, statements either. And they pull together, and uh, it ends up that you have Wisconsin, Minnesota, and he, he dovetails with Minnesota kind of early. They formalize their agreement with the uh, Minnesota Senate. One of the things you need to understand is that um, because of the lack of ability to travel, Synods liked their state lines. And so Wisconsin was Wisconsin, Minnesota was Minnesota, Missouri, Michigan. And that's what you had, was all the different state synods. And I put an extended quote in here, if you are interested in reading, um, of how uh, Bodding resisted, and this is interesting, the reason we are still Wisconsin Synod is because of Bodding's influence. And let me just tell you how that happened. C.F.W. Walther was a tremendous theologian and leader. He, when the Synodical Conference came together in 1872, he wanted all the state synods to kind of submit to the architecture of the General Synod. And you see what was happening? He was creating a national group, and they were going to be one Lutheran organization. Well, the state synods didn't like that. And I suppose it'd be just like when two Wells congregations try to do a school together. <laughs> you know how that goes, don't you? That's tough. You know, we do with our neighboring St. Matthews in Port Washington. But, but still, there's that identity. Uh, I, I still remember, and it's been uh, 10 years ago, when St. Matthews came to us and suggested that we start a new school in Sockville and uh, have an upper school and a lower school or have one school off our campus elsewhere. You can imagine how our leaders looked at that. We already have our school. <laughs> what do we need another school for, you know? Ah, trying to work together. And that's kind of what happened between the schools of Missouri and Wisconsin Synod. So Bodding held on to 
the school they had started. And he held on to the state and those boundaries. And so then you can read more about how CFW Walther couldn't quite influence them. He did cover a lot of those state synods were absorbed into Missouri. All right, you, you, you do want time for questions, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit further and maybe give me five minutes, okay? Page eight, the anniversary sermon. This is an interesting uh, uh, statement and, and I'll, I'll uh, tie you together with what was happening and then we'll just listen to a few of the words. 1875 was the 25th anniversary of the Wisconsin Senate. Bodding is president. They convene and he preaches the sermon and it becomes the anniversary service for that fledgling uh, little synod. When he preaches it, what is powerful above all here is his desire to serve the Lord through the word. Let me just sketch for you, if I were preaching this sermon, what it would look like. Page eight, you've got those indented paragraphs there, and he gives the history of how the church started 25 years ago, and all three of the original pastors uh, were off the scene. One was back in Germany, one was dead, and uh, no, two of them were dead. Neil Heuser had passed away uh, eight years before this. At the bottom of the page, you can see his theme in parts. We may boast with confident cheering. Top of page nine. Now, and here's where he demonstrates um, his desire to have people line up with the Lutheran confessions. And he says something about this little Wisconsin Synod. I love it because what he says is, why would God be praised among us on a 25th anniversary? And his, his answer is this, because we've done so much, because we have so many new congregations, so many pastors, and he goes, no. Because we have a school? No. Because we're, we're doing well? No. And he says the only reason, and he quotes there the, the psalm, he says, Psalm 108, the only reason is because God is glorified among us through his word. And now he says over and over through his word. Um, he talks about that word, uh, one of those paragraphs, you know, when, when I was translating, I actually had to translate this one completely from German. When I, when I translated that, I was just amazed. I wished my German was a, not as rusty as it used to be uh, because the, the, the use of the language was powerful. Uh, an example there, the middle paragraph on page nine, he says, uh, I'll start there at the beginning, God's size, grandeur, and majesty shine forth in many ways out in the world. The scripture says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And then he talks about the heavens. Lightning bolts that twitch through the clouds and thunder which rolls over our heads and waves rushing around the sea, they all direct us back to the words of the psalmist. It's the voice of the Lord that is speaking. And then he comes back and he says, what is more powerful than the thundering of the law? At the, the bottom he says, how terribly it penetrates into bones of the sinner when he expresses the sentence of damnation over Adam's line. He was a preacher. He made you feel the law, God's <laughs> presence. He made you feel it. And he almost frightened you with it. And he does that in here. Then, as you move on to page uh, 10, um, here's the deal. With conflict, he, he was the kind of a man that rather than move away from conflict like Mielhoiser often would do, Bodding would make his approach and make himself known right away. You know, some people are just that way. Some people pull away right away and some are more direct. He was really direct. And in the midst of this conflict, he demonstrates again in this sermon that you simply cannot go with these other churches because they are losing the word. And he'll make that in the middle of that uh, page, uh, start with the two or paragraphs there, middle of page 10. Or can one give the testimony of a church that they have the whole word of God in their possession when they champion reason and contradict the clear word of scripture that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth when a false and pernicious doctrine of election rips the crown of glory from the head of the world's savior with all his uh, embracing love. Now count the words in that sentence and see if that's the way our modern American preachers preach. That was a verbatim, you know, a, a translation. Their wording, their sentences were 80 and 90 and 100 words long. There's no per period in that old paragraph because, I mean, this is what you encounter. 
So you understand how I feel a little bit uh, humbled by their skill? And uh, again, German does that. They like lots of dependent phrases, one after another. How you follow the thinking in a German's uh, uh, preaching, you had to be really alert. <laughs> Man, what did he just say? Boy, if you got lost, it was in these German uh, sermons. Or can it be admitted of a church that she has God's word when instead of letting the word of God be valid as the power of God unto salvation, calls it a collection of dead letters and places the hope of the soul upon their own self-informed little discoveries and the confidence of human learnings. Such churches will never possess the undiminished word of God even when the Bible is right in their mouths. Boy, that sounds as modern as today. We still have the same exact problems. And then he talks about the little synod. And he says, she's the handmaiden of the Lord, but she has the truth. Okay? So it's right back to um, let's hold to the truth of the word of God and be sure that what we teach is true. All right, so I'm going to make you read a, a majority of this, uh, and I'll close with his final years and final thoughts. Uh, Bodding uh, would last until he was 89 years old. He would step down from the presidency at 65. But what's amazing about the man is that he would continue as the Synodical Conference president from 1882 until 1912. For 30 years, having replaced Walther, I think there was one more in between there, Walther as the Synodical president until he couldn't get there anymore, he served his church. He preached until he was uh, uh, 1908, so five years before, 84 years old. You talk about stamina. He says, you know, when he, re when he resigns from the presidency, he says, oh, I'm old and worn out. But then he goes on for another uh, 34 years. So, no, 24 years, 24 years. And then on the final page, page 12, um, I quote the uh, Lincoln sermon again, and it's kind of a grand conclusion uh, that talks about how peace, and I, I want you to see um, the paragraph that says human beings. It's the indented paragraph that says human beings. Human beings are not able to bestow any lasting peace. That is possible only with the Lord, who says, My peace I give unto you. To him we flee, and on his mercy we build our strength. He smote us because of our sins. He can also heal us because of his mercy, and for the sake of the merit of Christ. Really, really accurate theology, and what a man. Um, if you ever uh, wonder about straight shooters, um, you, you know, I, I had a guy, I, my brother's really into guns. I, I, I grew up around it, not so much myself. I do still hunt a little bit, but my, my brother, who loves guns, uh, would always ask the question, should you pack a pistol? And uh, the, then the question comes, well, don't you want one that can shoot a lot of shots? And the answer of one of the, the guys who had been in law enforcement for a lot of years was, you only need one that hits the mark, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, basically, that's the kind of man Bodding was. When he shot, he knew where he was aiming, and he shot, and it was accurate, and it was uh, very effective leadership. I would say um, we really have to give tribute to the distinction of the Wisconsin Synod uh, to the leadership of, of Pastor Bodding.
I was really affected by the Abraham Lincoln sermon. I was really affected. I, I do hope you'll read some of that. And the other sermon just demonstrated for me um, that in the middle of the conflict, body held to the word of God, and that's our heritage. And that sermon really says that. He says it in so many different ways, and, and you'll get that in the flavor of that sermon. So. Let's give